Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that there are about 37 trillion cells in the human body, and if you unwound all of the DNA encased in each cell and put it end to end, you would have enough DNA to stretch from the sun to Pluto and back 17 times. That is actually kind of profound. It's also totally, totally not true because the orbit of Pluto is not circular in case you're into astronomy. But anyway, it's a good analogy that's about right. If you look at the average orbit of Pluto. So let's just be precise here. Uh, Before I get into the show today, which I might have just hinted has something to do with DNA. If you don't know about the Bulletproof Performance Kits, that's probably because you haven't been to the Bulletproof store in a little while. If you're new to Bulletproof or you're just looking to figure out what works for other people, we've got a bunch of new performance kits, more than a dozen of them to choose from like the coffee kit, the brain kit, the detox kits. And these are based on what the Bulletproof ambassadors do that helps them perform better. So head on over to Bulletproof.com and check out how you can pair these products up to get more performance out of your brain every single day. Today's guest is a guy I'm really looking forward to having on the show, and you may not have heard of him before, but he's done some pretty uh, pretty amazing work. He's also a little bit uh, diverse. He actually studied psychotherapy for a little while (laughs) back in the day, and today he's a distinguished professor of biomolecular engineering at the University of California, uh, Santa Cruz. He's uh, also a bioinformatician combining math, computer science, and molecular biology to develop new algorithms to understand the human genome. He's pretty well known if you're a genetics-focused kind of person for his work on the Human Genome Project, where it was his team that made the first publicly available computational assembly of the human genome sequence on the internet. And uh, his name is uh, is Professor Dr. Professor Doctor, is that right? Anyway, his name is Dr. David Hausler. <laughs> Don't need the professors and the doctors. Dave, it's wonderful to be here. It's great to have a chance to talk with you uh, about the exciting potential for uh, DNA. And, and uh, you, we can probably use it for other things than reaching to Pluto and back. Um, and uh, I think uh, the analogy, though, is apt. There is an enormous amount of information in our genome, and we're just now beginning to understand it. I, I, was, uh, I was intrigued at your very early work with the human genome. Uh, back in, in my career in Silicon Valley, uh, I ran the web and internet engineering program for UC Santa Cruz, uh, the extension of Silicon Valley. So I, I used to teach working engineers how the internet worked instead of how computers pre-internet worked. It was like the, the first wave of, of e-commerce companies, Google's first servers were in our data centers. Uh, we also had a company called Double Twist. I did work on their infrastructure. Does that, <laughs> you know who these guys are, right? Double Twist, yeah. So, so literally I've been in the data center. Double Twist, for, for people listening, was the company that held the data, as I understand it, for the work you, you were doing computational analysis and they were doing the storage for the human genome. It was a whole floor of a data center in uh, Alameda, if I remember right, but I, I did architecture for them. Uh-huh. Double Twist was one of the early bioinformatics companies in the in in the upsurge leading up to the culmination of the Human Genome Project in the year 2000, and they, you know, they were were kind of built by the venture capital community to to cre- in view that you know the, here's an opportunity and it's surely to work out. But um, I think being being kind of conceived and created by the venture capitalist rather than an independent genius who really had a passion for it. They were doomed. I I thought they were doomed to failure from the beginning. You can't kind of create these companies out of whole cloth. You got to have individuals that are passionate about it. You need your Craig Venter. Yeah, you need somebody like Craig or one of the other great uh, thinkers. Who were the other, uh, maybe less famous, but other great thinkers in the field that, that you would name? The, the other two or three people worth following? Oh, yeah. George Church, Eric Lander. Uh, there are a number of really fascinating people in this area. I, I'll i get into trouble um, yeah. if I if I make <laughs> I, a long list. I understand. That's why I only asked for two. <laughs> uh, so there are... There are dozens and dozens, and you know, I'm just giving the the very big names that are probably household, uh, you know, somebody that's been on Colbert or right. you know that level, Francis Collins, uh, 
George have been on. So yeah, it's a great area. Um, we you know we do exciting things, and we're we're thrilled to be able to. One contribute. of the the things that you do that's particularly interesting is you've focused a lot on on the human genome and cancer. Uh, talk with me a little bit more about what you're doing to map our genetic predisposition for cancer. Like, like, like people listening may not know a lot about genetics, so give, give me the, the entry level view, oh, but sure. go a little deeper. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, so the, the quest to map the human genome started out um, early on. We had, a, we had a, actually a meeting here at Santa Cruz that Chancellor Sensheimer called it in 1985, and uh, had some of the great experts come and say, well, is it possible to map the three billion different bases of ACs, Ts, and Gs in the human genome, uh, figure out what a typical person's genome looks like by hardcore biochemistry to sequence this? And uh, it was initially thought that that would be impossible. But um, it turned out that by 2000, as you said, we, we had had a first draft and we were very proud to do the computational analysis. There were a bunch of little snippets of DNA that were produced by the genome sequencing machines and we did the key assembly to put them together uh, into a coherent first draft of our human genome, posted that on the internet um, on uh, July 7th, 2000. And this was simultaneous with the production of the, of the genome by Solera, so Craig Venter's company, um, and, and my good uh, friend and uh, colleague, Gene Myers, we went to school together, led the assembly of that version of the human genome. So by 2000, suddenly there were two versions of the human genome. And uh, that uh, set the stage for a subsequent development in thinking about, okay, so now if this is the overall map for the human genome, uh, and we're all 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level, then what about the differences? And how do those differences affect our health? The primary differences that people were thinking about in the initial stages were the differences that we have that in our genomes that we inherited from our mom and dad, right? So you get one copy of a gene from mom and one copy of a gene from dad, and Little variations in those genes in the DNA can make a difference in your health and in, in your um, propensity to get various diseases. But actually, there is a disease, cancer, in which new changes happen as you grow older. So not in those trillions of cells that you were just mentioning in this intro, um, they all start essentially with the same genome that you got from mom and dad. But as you grow old, they accumulate changes. And so uh, when cells divide, they naturally don't make a perfect copy of their genome for the daughter cells. That's a main source of differences. But also, uh, you can have various chemicals that are carcinogenic and increase the amount of uh, mutation that occurs. Uh, in particular, smoking uh, creates these compounds and it can cause mutations in the cells in your lungs. Sunlight can cause mutations in the cells uh, of your skin. And those are then significant events. Rarely do they do anything bad. Most of them make no difference whatsoever. But with trillions of cells, the odds are that if you keep going on long enough, if you live long enough, then you're going to have a bad combination of mutations that causes that cell to grow into a cancer tumor. So we now have confirmed through careful investigation over the last few decades that cancer is actually very much a genetic disease. The cause of cancer is mutations that happen in some of the cells in your body that cause them to go rogue. So treating cancer is all about killing the cells that have those dangerous mutations. And it is an enormous effort and we are learning so much more about it now that we can read the DNA of the tumor cells. I'm working on a book about mitochondria right now. 
and uh -huh. uh, going pretty deep on a Krebs cycle, uh, but it, it's a, a book meant for lay people. And frankly, I'm not a university grade uh, researcher on mitochondrial benchtop chemistries, but I'm pretty good at what I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and I've interviewed guys like Dominic D'Agostino looking at the, the mitochondrial uh, uh, angle on cancer and the mitochondrial DNA mutations, which happen more quickly than the human genome DNA. Uh, what? Uh -huh. uh, so uh, nuclear uh, thank genome, you. I'm not even sure you what I said. I admit I was the. Uh, yes, thank right. you. Is yeah, that human duh. genome? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the human genome has a nuclear component and the mitochondrial genome. Th right. Thank you. That is exactly uh, what I was thinking, and uh, so you have the the nuclear DNA, which is where we focused all of this, and and we ha we are developing this view. Uh, at least I am uh, uh, looking at at Wallace's research on mitochondrial epigenetics and what gets expressed from the, the uh -huh. nuclear side of things. And I'm, I'm wondering your take on this. You are one of the top people in the world looking at the nuclear side of, of genetics and cancer, and I'm talking to other people who are looking at the mitochondrial dysfunction side of cancer. How do you line those two perspectives up? I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I think um, mitochondria have now, you know, been shown to be involved in a number of diseases, including cancer. They are, of course, the energy factories of the cell, and uh, as such, um, uh, that among the other uh, key roles they play in telling a cell whether uh, it's, it's over, basically, you should commit suicide, or whether you should keep going. Uh, so all, all of these information and energy processes that are rooted through the mitochondria are important to the cell and important to disease. So we, we certainly appreciate the value uh, of the mitochondria, even though it has a tiny genome, 16,000 bases of DNA compared to the 3 billion bases of DNA in the, in the nuclear genome. So the nuclear genome contains more of what we are, just more bits of information about what we are. But the mitochondria is, is, tiny as it is, it's very important uh, also to our health. And there are a number of new studies that show mitochondrial uh, effects in cancer and how that can, uh, how that can alter the course of the disease. Uh, but again, um, it, there are, there, there's more going on in the nuclear part of the genome in cancer than there is in the mitochondria. And that's not surprising just because there's so much more complexity just, in just the given the size part. there okay yes just given the size how far are we from being able to look at someone's uh, nuclear dna and saying well based on this we have a, a a very reasonable likelihood of what kind of cancer you're going to get if you get cancer we'll never get to that point where we can be highly predictive because the progression of cancer depends on random and inherently unpredictable events. It could be a cosmic ray that comes down and hits the right place in the genome of the right cell at the right time or uh, wrong place, right, wrong time if you want. And that, you know, or, or that you could start be, smoking, right? <laughs> yeah, or you could start smoking. So, so we won't be able to predict it in, in that sense, but the, you know, the, I think the, the largest hope for the future is that we would be able to catch it earlier than we are now. What's uh, the most difficult problem with uh, cancer today is that patients are coming in uh, after the cancer has progressed to a point where it's very difficult to unwind and get rid of all the cancer cells. The hardest thing about treating cancer um, is that you need to get rid of all the cells. If you leave some behind, then they grow back. Uh, and that is you know, that's the, that's the problem. On the other hand, the good thing about cancer is that you only have to kill the cells, you don't have to fix them. So if you have cells that you need, you know, your neurons or something, and you're trying to alter them to work right, that's very much harder than killing cells. So the good part about cancer is we only have to kill, the bad part is we have to kill them all. So there are challenges. Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of things I want to ask you based on that. Uh, uh, I've looked a lot at, at the, the respiration of cells, and it, it seems like there are like precancerous cells that can be fixed where you haven't kicked off that cell death process called aptosis. Do you ascribe to that? And so I'm, I'm, I'm not a cancer expert. You are. So I, I'm asking questions without, uh, without uh, 
uh, without, without meaning to question what you're saying there, uh, in, or to challenge what you're saying there, but just to, to get an understanding. Because sure. I know a lot of people who've listened to the show have, have had se- heard several guests talking about you know, increasing electrons in mitochondria and reversing uh, hypoxic states in cells and sort of turning anaerobic cells back into aerobic cells, thereby preventing them from further progressing to become cancerous. Is there is there meat on the bone for that theory uh, in in your experience, or was this more of a, a nuclear DNA problem? There, you know, there definitely is a metabolic shift that occurs in cancer, and it does towards anaerobic from aerobic. Um, that is part of the uh, the cancer switching into a metabolism that is optimized for tumor growth, um, and and. Cancer, of course, is an is an evolutionary struggle within your own body. The the you know the cancer cells are competing for real estate against your normal cells, and and so growing faster and being more vigorous and stealing resources like blood vessels are part of what you know are characteristics of cancer because that's characteristic of who wins this battle for real estate in your body. Um, so part of that is shifting metabolism, and that brings, again, in the mitochondrial uh, aspect because mitochondria are so fundamental in this metabolic um, process. Um, but again, that's just part of the story, right? So the, uh, the overall cell cycle is critical, and that's been the most extensively investigated in cancer. You, you have to start dividing, um, and you have to divide a lot and rapidly to, to be a bad and dangerous cancer. Um, and what happens is that when you're an embryo, your cells are dividing a lot, uh, and then that process slows down. And so when you're adult, most of your cells are, are senescent. They're basically, they finish their dividing and they're occupying their place in your body, and they shouldn't start dividing again. And so when they when they revert to this, wow, I'm, I think I'm uh, like a stem cell-like thing and I'm going to divide again, that's uh, a symptom of cancer okay. uh, that is more, I'd say, more central and profound than the energy shift, but, but it's all part of the story. There are, there are many hallmarks of cancer uh, that, that we look at. What do you do in your life to minimize your chances of getting cancer? Well, I try to use sunscreen. I don't smoke. Um, I watch uh, some of the foods that I eat. So we don't want to. You don't want to eat moldy peanuts, for example. Uh, <laughs> aflatoxin right. is one of the one of the most potent carcinogens known. Uh, so there are a number of chemical uh, carcinogens that aren't necessarily um, just uh, from industrial processes. They are so-called organic, natural carcinogens, aflatoxin grows, peanut mold grows, you know, if you're an organic farmer or uh, not, right? So you you can't just say, well, I eat organic and so I'm safe, right? You have to be very, very cognizant of of the uh, molecules that you're exposed to to make sure that they're not ca- uh, cancer, but uh, cancer causing. But as I said before, really the most important thing is detection and early prevention because no matter how careful you are, there's still this increasing probability that you will have that unlucky event that will cause mutations in your cells as you grow older. And there really, no amount of diet and lifestyle can prevent that risk because it is an intrinsic fact of the way cells divide and and how they age uh, that will let us, um, that will force us to be exposed to cancer. And in fact, there is, many have said that it's, a, there's a dual uh, relationship between cancer and longevity. So we, we may alter our mitochondrial, if you're an NAD plus person I, and I so am. forth, we, you are right, <laughs> okay, so a lot of us are. Uh, so we may alter our, our, our lifestyle and even our chemistry to live longer. Uh, but that will have the effect of increasing the amount of uh, time that our cells are waiting to mutate. And so ultimately, your, your chances for cancer will just accumulate. So you have to, if we are, if we are going to be successful in, very, uh, in a high longevity situation, then we will have to do better with cancer. 
uh, it, no matter, it won't be diet that will save us from cancer, it's going to have to be detection and prevention and rapid treatment. Okay. And we'll need that more and more as we age. Uh, no doubt if you live longer, you have a, a greater incidence of cancer. That's it, yep. Uh, and there's nothing that can change that completely. When we talked about NAD plus there uh, for listeners, uh, when your your mitochondria are making energy, you add electrons to NAD plus to make it into NADH. And uh, what's going on there is if you can change the ratio of those two molecules, you can change the efficiency of your mitochondria and thereby, well, have more energy right now, which is one of the big topics of my upcoming book, uh, but also uh -huh. potentially change your risk of the mitochondrial side of cancer. At least that's what some of the research I've seen says. Um, basically by improving the efficiency of Krebs cycle, reducing oxidative species in the cells, it appears to have a cancer reducing risk. And for some compounds, it even appears to make chemotherapy work better. Chemotherapy is a hell of a toxic thing. Right? Yeah. So, so uh, all the uh, organic fruit and so forth that you're eating um, has a little effect compared to the dramatic effects of the chemotherapy compounds that are commonly used to treat cancer. So uh, this and radiation, of course, uh, again, which is still commonly used to treat cancer. So one of the goals of cancer research based on our knowledge of the DNA and the DNA mutations is to try to get beyond some of these uh, more toxic uh, methods for treating cancer uh, and that you know that's uh, if, if you're faced with cancer that is so much more important than the healthy diet or, or the NAD plus it really is important that you that we get to the point where we can have therapies that are precision targeted towards the cells that have cancer and have little collateral damage on the other cells and that's been a major goal and it's a major hope uh, you know, the vice president has announced a moonshot and there's optimism. A lot of this optimism is based on the idea that uh, maybe we can coax or include, in, uh, induce your own immune system to fight off the cancer cells. And this is an idea that's been around for decades but only become really operational within the last few years and uh, has resulted in some spectacular results for certain types of cancers. Uh, and we're still trying to understand why it works for those cancers and doesn't seem to work for other cancers, at least in the incarnation we know about this uh, immune approach, which is some kind, sometimes called immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that, that would obviously be a terrific approach to cancer if you can just get your own body to eliminate the cancer by targeting uh, your immune system to it. That's terrific. Um, in part of that in combination, a lot of people are talking about to doing that in combination with crippling or killing many of the cancer cells. And, and the immune system is drawn to a, uh, into a fight um, sometimes uh, that is started by either chemotherapy or some other kind of uh, targeted therapy. And if the immune system can lock on and finish the job, that is terrific in, in cancer. The immunotherapy you're talking about there actually saved my cousin's life. Wow. Uh, and I, I, I wish I knew exactly what kind of cancer it was. It was. I believe it was a brain thing, some kind of pretty aggressive mm -hmm. thing. This is not a cousin I'm close to. It's you know, wife's family in Europe. Uh, but he flew to Israel and did uh, a, a very advanced form of immunotherapy where they essentially in layman's term, made a vaccine <laughs> to his own cancer yes. cells, mm -hmm. uh, injected it, and he is perfectly healthy with no signs of cancer today. And it, it's this wouldn't have happened five years ago. It's it's just no, shocking. It couldn't. Yeah, it's it's spectacular. Uh, that that form of treatment where you're actually uh, using an inactivated virus or something like that yeah. to draw uh, attention of the immune system to the tumor. Uh, you could do this with bacterial uh, kind of molecules that bacteria um, create or viruses. They do this in, in, uh, in bladder cancer, for example. Uh, they'll use uh, these kind of molecules that activate, strongly activate the immune system to then uh, recognize the, the tumor. They, we're very interested uh, in, in the, the actual molecules that the tumor displays 
that allow the immune system to distinguish the tumor cells from the normal cells. And we know a lot about this uh, from immunology. We know, in fact, that all of the proteins that are made inside the cell and, and make the cell work and do all its stuff are uh, essentially ground up into pieces and some of those pieces, a representative set of those pieces of protein are actually displayed on the surface of the cell as if to say to the rest of the body, this is what's going on in me right now. Here's a sampling of pieces of my proteins. So in a sense, the, the, a cell in your body is telling the rest of your body, here's what I'm about right now. And your immune system is acclimated to recognize those signals and say, oh, you know, it's constantly surveilling your cells and saying, oh, well, it looks like this one's okay. Oh yeah, this one's okay. And so when a cancer cell comes along, it gets DNA mutations and some of those DNA mutations then cause the proteins to be mutated. And so you get little snippets of mutated proteins on the surface of the cell. And that's what the immune system uses to recognize that something wonky is going on on that cell. A vaccine essentially functions to alert the immune system that this is the kind of thing you should be looking for in attacking the cell. This whole system evolved over millions and millions of years of evolution. For example, if a, if a cell gets infected by a virus, the virus will make its own viral proteins and those will show up as foreign proteins and then be recognized by the immune system and they, the, the cell will know to, the immune system will know to attack. And it's a, it's a regional phenomenon, so you want to get a hot zone around the tumor where the immune system is highly active. And so it turns out that in the last few years, we've learned that tumors have these tricks for shutting down the immune system. Everything in biology is about balance. And so uh, over these years of evolution, actually human cells have evolved a way to say, hey, I'm in trouble or, hey, I'm really in trouble, you should attack me or, hey, I'm only kind of in trouble, shut down the attack. And that latter message is used by cancer. So the cancer will actually distort this natural biological process and make the cancer cells such that they're saying, well, yeah, I'm kind of in trouble, but not so bad, so don't really attack me. And new drugs that shut off that signal are the most exciting thing in immunotherapy. So they're trying to make so the cancer can't hide from the immune system anymore. But it requires two things. It requires the inhibition of these don't kill me, I'm really okay signals, but it also requires that there be at least something, some different protein on the surface that the cancer is displaying that the immune system can latch onto to distinguish it. And actually that is from DNA. So I, I made this long story so we could get back to why <laughs> we care about DNA sequencing cancer because we have programs and about a dozen other labs now have computer programs where we can take a sample of your cancer tissue, sequence it in a sequencing, a DNA sequencing machine, and then use computer analysis to infer what kinds of abnormal proteins are in the cancer, what kinds of pieces of them might be on the surface, and hence what the cancer cell might be telling your immune system. And we also look at whether it's telling, whether it's spending, sending out these special signals about, well, don't really harm me. So we, if we can tell whether a cell is actually displaying that it's different and also maybe shutting down the immune response, then we know that by reversing the shutdown of the immune response, the immune system should be able to recognize it because it is displaying something different. And if it doesn't recognize it, we could actually, in principle, customize a vaccine because we know how, what kind of different signal we need to train the immune system to recognize that cancer. So this is a, it's a very, very exciting potential coming up here. We're still years off from actual routine use of the vaccine-related cancer, like your, your uh, cousin uh, was in a very, very special program that's not routine in all hospitals. This, uh, the new drugs, the so-called PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor drugs, checkpoint blockade drugs, um, which 
shut down this PD-1 signal that the cancer is using to hide from the immune system are now in almost routine use for many different cancers, in particular melanomas, and they were approved recently for non-small cell lung cancer uh, and, and so forth. So they, we are getting to the point where this is not exotic anymore, but becoming part of regular clinical practice. But before the vaccine stuff is regular, it's going to require more work. There's a, a set of genes that have been identified that make people more prone to autoimmune conditions. Uh, they're on the yes. HLA, DR. Uh, I'm one of the one in four people who has a tendency towards autoimmunity. I'm sensitive to toxic mold in the environment. I actually did a documentary yes. about that because uh, it absolutely just causes inflammation neurologically and, and, and throughout my physiology, uh, which also increases my risk of cancer and all. Uh, at least, uh, at least according to some of the stuff I've read, does. Yes. Now, that's irritating because my plan is to live to 180 years old. And so right. I, I do yes. what I can. And I, I say How that's my plan. I, I'm right. doing everything I can to get there. I don't know if right. I will or not, exactly. but I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm sure going to do everything possible that normal people would never think about. And how quickly am I going to be able to use CRISPR or some other technology to just go in there and get rid of those few annoying genes and some meaningful, substantial subset of my cells? So over the course of seven years, as I replace my cells, I can just be done with that. So, um, so it's very interesting that you bring up the HLA genes because they are uh, the scaffolds that actually hold the proteins to show the immune system. So the HLA genes are amazing in the sense that they are uh, generic proteins that will that will load on a small piece of, of random protein from some protein that's being made in the, in, the, in the cell and then carry it to the surface and display it to the immune system. And the immune system comes along and recognizes it uh, by these cells called T cells. They're part of your, your white blood cells. Uh, and the T cells have these receptors and they're constantly looking to see whether the peptide that's being displayed by your HLA molecule is of the normal kind or whether it's something weird that they haven't seen before. And that is the key event in immunity. It's a key event in deciding whether it's okay or whether something is wrong. Now, if something is wrong, genuinely wrong, like a virus has invaded the cell or it's a cancer cell, then you want the T cells to respond. You want the T cells to go into emergency mode, send out these cytokine signals and all of these other signals that say something is wrong, we've got to start killing. And this ultimately, the, the killer, so-called literally killer T cells are very powerful in terms of attacking cells. So it's a very powerful system but it also has to be carefully controlled. And so the autoimmunity problems that you refer to come in when there's a misadjustment of the immune system so that you have a propensity now for the immune system to make a mistake and think normal cells need to be attacked. And, and then once your immune system starts attacking certain of your normal cells, then you have problems. And so you may have arthritis if it's attacking the cells in your joints. Um, I, I had arthritis when, when I was 14 in my knees. Uh, I don't have it anymore, but I did. <laughs> yep. So uh, you may have multiple sclerosis if it attacks the, the sheaths on your uh, particular uh, axons and your neurons and so forth. I've never said that's on the air, but um, I am reasonably certain that I would have ended up with MS had I not radically changed my biology the way, the, using the lifestyle and all the other things I've done. I, I'd never been diagnosed with it, but I could see what was going on in my nervous system <laughs> uh, with, with neurological inflammation. Uh, I'm friends with Terry Walls, you know, minding my mitochondria, and I, I'm stronger now at 43 than I was at 23 uh, because I'm aware uh, of the problems and able to take, uh, uh, basically to, to take action to, to turn that off. Right. Most people aren't, uh, but I, I suspect I would have, by the time I'm 50, I probably would have had MS. I don't think there's a chance in hell that's going to happen to me now. <laughs> well, good. Uh, well, uh, I, you know, that's the most important thing is the health thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I could say, actually, I'm stronger now at 62 than I was at 43. So good. Wow. <laughs> it's possible to keep it up. That's powerful. Well, mainly, 
mainly because I've started working out in that the last helps. five years. You know, <laughs> you get to a certain age and you think, oh, my God, if I don't do something. And uh, I was, I was, you know, not really paying any attention and not really doing anything for, you know, regular health. Uh, now I am. But, um, but back to the immune system. I think it's not so much that you want to actually go in and try to genetically change your HLA molecules. I mean, every cell in your body has the version of HLA genes that you got from mom and dad. Yep. And my suggestion is that you, you got to live with that. It's not going to be easy to change all of those cells. They make up your whole <laughs> body, right? And you don't want to start changing your fundamental genetics. Sure I do. Um, Why not? Well, okay. <laughs> let's, let's not go there right okay. now. Right. You, you may want to do that, but... <laughs> But that's not going to be the easy route. Agreed. Um, okay, I'm with you there. <laughs> but what happens is, is then, so there's got to be some particular peptides that these HLAs are expressing to your immune system in particular cells that where the problem is arising, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some particular misrecognition, misrecognition phenomenon that's happening. It's not all over your body. It's, it's only under certain circumstances that these certain HLAs will produce an inappropriate immune response that causes uh, autoimmunity. So if we could target just that, just like we do cancer, if we could target that inappropriate immune response specifically without messing with any other part of your body or your immune system, that would be, in my mind, a more appropriate approach to autoimmunity. And the beautiful thing about this is now we have billions of dollars being poured into immunotherapy because cancer is a huge, huge topic. And so we are learning about the molecular details of the immune response at an astounding rate because it's driving billions and billions and billions of dollars of investment in new immunotherapy drugs. Part of that will have, and I'll make a, make a prediction here that might be a little comforting, part of that will, will have the side effect of greater understanding and greater technology that will allow us to manipulate the immune system. So we can imagine a world in a decade where we can measure exactly what your immune system is doing at any time. And we can say, okay, this looks great. All right, you had a cold two weeks ago and your immune system reacted to it. It looks like it's appropriately calming down, right? And so we're not having T cells that are reacting to that rhinovirus anymore. We don't need them. and 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 so it's great. What we want to be able to say is, but if this is indeed the case, we're starting to see an autoimmune reaction in certain tissues where you, you have these particular T cells with this receptor that's recognizing this displayed peptide, and that is an inappropriate interaction between the T cell and the normal cell. We need to, we need to stop that interaction. On the other hand, you may also have a tiny, tiny cancer that's starting somewhere in your body and your immune system is not recognizing the abnormal protein. So these events are two sides of the same coin. In the one case, you want the T cell to recognize the protein and the other case, you want it to stop recognizing or stop reacting to the protein. That's the, that's the uh, auto, uh, uh, autoimmunity case. So because cancer and autoimmunity are, the same, are two sides of the same coin, the more we understand the system of how the immune system recognizes the peptides that are being displayed, and the more we have technology to manipulate it, the better we'll get on both sides. And I think the enormous investment is going to pay off within a decade. Well, we'll be able to have more precise manipulation, more precise surveillance, and then more precise manipulation of the immune system, which could save you a whole world of pain in the future if you have an autoimmune disease. And it's well worth the investment. I mean, national, international investment in research. It is one of the most important things you can do because this stuff affects at least one in four people and, and prob Absolutely. probably more than that if you look at just subsets like Hashimoto's and things like that that are almost rampant at this point. Now, I'm going to, I'm debating. I, I want to talk about the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, the computer hacker side of me. Like, I, I, I'm really intrigued at sharing this volume of data and doing it securely. But before we go there, 
I just said, I, I want to see if I can uh, either slightly freak you out or offend you, given what you just said about uh, immune presentation. One of the things that reduced my autoimmunity, uh, and I haven't talked about this on the air either before, but I, I just want to pick your brain. Just tell me if I'm crazy. Um, when you have an autoimmune reaction, you release a lot of antigens in your urine. And there's disgusting Ayurvedic practices of drinking urine and things like that that don't work. Uh, but are meant to work via this pathway. However, when you take those antigens, collect them from urine when you're having uh, an immune reaction, uh, these are the inappropriate uh, uh, immune molecules, so the, the, uh, inappropriate, they're immune molecules created by an inappropriate response. If you present them to the immune system as foreign molecules, you can make antibodies to your own antibodies and cancel them out. So when I have a big autoimmune attack, I actually, you know, this is going to sound crazy. I didn't invent this. I will take the urine, I'll mix it with uh, lidocaine, and I'll inject it through a 50 micropore filter into my muscle tissue. So it presents those antigens. And I've had, I, I can eat foods I couldn't eat before, and I have a lot less reactivity even to the things I'm most reactive to. It seems to be working. And it's like completely caveman level uh, <laughs> immune therapy. But I'm kind of liking my life. Am I nuts? You're nuts. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, before I went back to graduate school, I worked a ranch. It's an old family ranch. We've had it in uh, near Paso Robles. We've had it in the family since 1920. My great uncle started it. And uh, he got ill and died. And uh, there was nobody really there to take care of the property. So in between undergraduate school and graduate school, I spent a couple of years um, managing the property, the farm, where we grew almonds and uh, walnuts and uh, dozens of different varieties of fruit. It's a little organic farm. Gorgeous. And um, I was had a hell of a time with poison oak. Uh, very reactive to it and being out in the field, uh, I was always seeming, it was seeming an annoyance and you, you couldn't get away from it. So I was uh, downtown one time, when Paso Robles was a little town, mm -hmm. and not the, uh, not the wine mecca that it is today. And uh, um, I, I was talking uh, with um, an old farmer there, Charlie Yearwood was his name, he's a great, he did a lot of tractor work around the area and uh, I had noticed him on a job um, burning poison oak and then actually driving his tractor into it to compact it and breathing this poison oak smoke. And I, I just couldn't believe that's the worst exposure you can you have. You could die from that. Like. Oh, you could die from that. You could definitely die from that. The oils of the poison oak coming in. And I said, Charlie, why, how is it that you're not uh, allergic to poison oak? And he said, well, I, I was when I was young. I, I had a horrible reaction to poison oak. But um, I found this uh, old woman down in Paso Robles. Uh, some, some people call her a witch. Uh, <laughs> but she said... Uh, all you have to do is go out there in the springtime when the leaves are just about the size of a squirrel's ear and uh, you just eat one of them, come back the next day and eat another one of them. You do that for seven days, you never have a problem with poison oak again. So uh, somewhat the same principle, right? <laughs> you're, you're kind of overloading your system at some point and trying to get your immune system to switch. I don't know. I was stupid enough at this point. <laughs> to you tried think, it? Think that this should might work. And uh, I was living there with my best friend, Don Antonell. And, uh, and so I went out one morning in the spring, picked the leaf, chewed it up. <laughs> Don, what the hell? Here we go, right? Got back home, spent the night worrying about it. Nothing happened. Got up in the morning, told Don what I had done. And, and I said, look, this is proof. I feel great. This is great. Day one. I'm, I'm tip top. So went down, ate another leaf second day, came back, so forth, went to bed. Woke up in the morning, my <laughs> whole system was swelled. My whole mouth was swelled up. My whole internal digestive system was on fire. I was a total mess. So, you know, I, and I got very little sympathy from Don. The only <laughs> thing he said, as I recall, is, 
I guess you don't know how big a squirrel's ear is, do you? <laughs> you had to wonder whether this was all a joke to see if he could get you to do it. Right. <laughs> Charlie, yeah. Charlie's a good joke. Uh, so I don't know. I uh, I think you're crazy. I, I have been called that before, and, and I, I might have sustained one or two biohacking injuries. Uh, um, so I, I appreciate you uh, both sharing the story and, and rendering your opinion there. I, I figured I was unlikely to do a lot of harm, and I'm always curious. So if I think it's not going to really, really cause permanent negative effects, and it might work. Someone's got to be the guinea pig. It might as well be. Me. Right. Well, let, let's let's talk about sharing the human genome because now that we've we've got this data, and, and the data is relatively portable. I just had my entire genome sequenced. Uh, at HLI. I, haven't even, I don't even have the results yet, but uh, the full thing, which is pretty cool that a, a mere mortal can get it done. It's still reasonably expensive, but um, okay. Well, price is still coming down. It, it is. And, so and whole my, genome sequencing. How much is the current price? Uh, that? Well, the cheapest price is a couple of thousand bucks if you just, you know, get the machine to do it and so without the interpretation and so forth. Okay. So that's, um, you know, that's getting to be within range of a uh, larger and larger number of people. And then, of course, if you just want to snip it, you want to look at, at, the, at, at the tiny fraction, say one, one out of a thousand different positions that are the most informative positions in your genome. You can just go to 23andMe and 95 bucks, I think you can get, uh, you can get a, a, a glimpse, I would say, a snapshot of some of the important uh, parts of your genome. So whether you want the whole thing done or just a little bit, um, it, it's the price, you know, can range from a hundred to several thousand dollars, but there's a, there's the, the, the these are not undoable numbers. Uh, what are the big barriers to sharing this data? Like, like we have a world, that, let's say we're, we're now thousands of people have their full genome sequenced and soon hundreds of thousands or millions of people uh, what are the barriers to doing this, and, and what are you doing with Global Alliance for Genomics and Health to, to solve right. those? So, when we did the first genome as part of the public human genome sequencing project, uh, we were very proud to be a public effort that was going to share all of our data. And, and Really, the day July seventh that we posted that July seventh two thousand was the 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 best day of my life. I mean, it's the day I'm most proud of. Um, we shared that first glimpse of our genetic heritage, free and unrestricted, as as open source, open data, on the web, and that was part of the whole structure of the. Uh, public effort, uh, that it was scientists all over the world just trying to help humanity making this information fully open and available uh, so that we could most rapidly advance our medical research and our basic biology and, and, and let's face it, the understanding of who we are. I mean, evolution is a process that created our genome over billions of years from our distant, distant ancestors and the results of that are really the product of untold numbers of stumbles and triumphs by our ancestors through the eons. This is a fundamental script for humanity that has been sculpted by so much pain and triumph that you have to make it, in our opinion, public and something that we can all cherish and understand but what happens as we get now into medical sequencing, clinical sequencing, is that the tendency is just the opposite. The tendency is to lock the data up immediately and not to share. And part of that is uh, just HIPAA and the whole uh, tradition of medical privacy. And, and so HIPAA, the, for, for people listening, define HIPAA. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> this is the Health Information Protection Act that um, makes sure that when somebody asks uh, about your medical information, they don't tell that person unless it's you or a designated relative uh, so that people cannot go spying or snooping around on your hospital records. Now, there are very good reasons why we don't want to let arbitrary people have access to our medical records. And the DNA is increasingly part of the medical record, so we're not arguing 
uh, that, that the DNA and all of the rest of the medical records should just be made public. But the problem is that when you start to not even make this information available for research, then you're losing an enormous opportunity. And cancer is a great example. We know that there have been mutations in cancer tumors from the very beginning, and we know that there are untold millions of different combinations of mutations in those tumors. But we will not be able to figure out the important ones that we need to develop therapies for versus the unimportant ones, sometimes called passenger mutations, that don't do anything unless we have a large number of cases to study. We basically, everything, if, I often say that if you just have one genome, you can't learn anything. It's only by comparing genomes to each other that the patterns emerge. And anybody who knows statistics also can understand that there is a, a signal to noise ratio problem when you have only very little data and a lot of variables, a lot of things to look at. Well, the genome is a classic example of that. There's three billion bases that can change. And so there are a lot of variables to deal with. And in order to do that, we need to look at a lot of genomes. So the focus of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which I co-founded three years ago, is to create a mechanism so the world can share these genomic data. There are certain types of genomic data that can be shared openly and publicly. For example, it's reasonable that even if you don't share your genome that you got from mom and dad, your so-called germline genome, technically, you may still want to care, you share the changes that happened in your cancer tumor. Because you're yeah. not going to pass those on to your kids. They're not private to you. They're like any other medical symptom. And we need to account for the frequency of all of these medical symptoms, including the genetic variants as well as the other measured variants. So we have a program right now that we're trying to push um, called the Cancer Gene Trust, where we're trying to get people to share the genetic variants that occur only in their cancer and just publish them openly so everybody can research those. There's no, if we do this right, there's no privacy problem there. The problem is that the general public doesn't understand the distinction. It's a scientific distinction, right, between DNA that's changed in the tumor versus DNA that's part of your cells that you're going to pass on to your kids. And so that gets complicated to explain that, but if we can get that kind of thing to be shared, that would be great. Now there also are cases though where we want to share information from your germline DNA, information that you will pass on to your kids. And so another project we have is the BRCA challenge. So you may know the gene BRCA, uh, many people know it because Angelina Jolie yeah. made the famous announcement that because she had a genetic variant in her BRCA gene that made her highly prone to breast cancer, she was going to have a double radical mastectomy. Uh, that certainly was a wake-up call all over the world to the, the importance of this particular gene and the importance of genetic testing when it comes to thinking about your uh, and planning for your future. The problem is that right now, when women go in to get tested for BRCA, a very significant percentage of those women are, are told, yes, you have an unusual variant in the gene BRCA, but it's a variant of uncertain significance. So go away and worry about it, but we can't <laughs> tell you anything about it. What a horrible, what a horrible yeah. report for a woman to get. And there's one and only one reason for that is that we haven't shared the data, so we haven't accumulated enough observations of that variant to be able to decide whether it is associated with breast cancer or not. If we'd only been sharing the data, we probably wow. could be able to tell. So the BRCA exchange wow. is about getting the world to share that data. Now in this case, we're sharing it with experts. We're not publishing it openly on the web. We're not asking women to publish their BRCA, full BRCA gene sequence, that the same one they will pass on to their kids. We're not asking them to publish this. We're asking them to share it with the experts and let the experts 
help classify the variants so that everyone gets a better diagnosis. So those are two projects, one where you're publicly open, one that we're trying to at least share the genomic information with the experts. In, in 2011, at a, at a big data conference called the GigaOM conference in New York, mm -hmm. uh, I proposed uh, a system like the one you're talking about, a policy-based system that allow you to expose some of your genetic or lifestyle information, for instance, mm -hmm. your fitness tracker. Uh, information uh, so that you could share it with your community, you could share it with your doctor, you could sell it to a drug company, you could sell it without your name on it, you could put, you could associate mm -hmm. different things, do it all by policy. So essentially create a marketplace for your data. Sure. Uh, because a lot of people also react, I, I don't want big pharma doing research on my genes because, well, basically most people that I know now kind of look at big pharma as, as not necessarily honest, like one step away from big tobacco. And frankly, if they're going to patent one of my genes, I get a cut or you guys don't get my genes. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that <laughs> attitude has got to change. <laughs> the, the, the solution to that is to prevent patenting. And Amen. this is very relevant Amen. <laughs> uh, in the breast cancer area, because there was one company, Myriad Genetics, that had the exclusive patent on BRCA gene testing, and that was yeah. thrown out by the Supreme Court two years ago. What a win. Hallelujah. You know, yeah. there's a step forward. So I think, I think the, the goal is not to, not to keep information from the pharmaceutical industry, but to make sure that they're not misusing it in the sense of exclusively patenting genes. Uh, because we do need people to develop drugs, and so well, I think it, you're yeah. you're really going to cut yourself short <laughs> if you if you completely cripple the pharmaceutical industry. So no. I, I I tend to take a less radical view of that. But go I, ahead. I, I'm speaking for a lot of the people uh, listening to the show, and and I I have no fundamental problem with drugs. I, I, drugs have saved lots of people's lives, and like probably including mine when they had a really bad infection or something. That's right. Uh, so no problem there. Some of the business models and behavior associated with these companies uh, are, are ethically challenged. Um, you know, for instance, uh, we make drugs that reverse the effects of the pesticides that we sell from the other arm of the company. That kind of <laughs> crap has to stop. Monsanto, I'm talking to you. All right. Uh, um, and and there, there's other disturbing things like that that, um, yeah. um, that that I think people have woken up to and, and they're not willing to contribute to that system. But if you put them in a hospital and say, there's a tumor this big inside your head, they're going to gladly consume whatever cocktail of, of things is going to get rid of, of, of that, assuming that it is a cocktail of drugs that are going to do it. Um, we haven't talked about vitamin D in cancer. We haven't talked about ketones in cancer, some of the other things uh, that we probably won't get to in the time we've got. But You have to talk to my brother about vitamin D, Oh yeah, Mark Hausler. He's, the, he, he's the, one of the major discoverers of the hormonal form of vitamin D. And... Uh, really, really is an expert on the, how it uh, increases longevity and may uh, help with cancer and so forth. He's devoted his life to the study of vitamin D. Brilliant. What's his name? Mark Hausler, my brother, my oh, older brother. Would you facilitate an introduction? Oh, sure, would, I'll have him on. Yeah, he's great. I would love to. I, I've been using vitamin D and looking at that and, and the various interactions with light for a long time. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Uh, what, what, a, what a neat family. Your reunions must be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's talk about what you're doing with, with the blockchain, which for, for people listening, this is what Bitcoin uses. And, and this is the idea that you can, uh, you can take data that you, wanna, you want control over who sees it and who does what with it. And you can encrypt the data with the data that came before and the data that came after it. So you can sort of track whether anyone's accessed it or if anyone has, has messed with it. Uh, do you have this rolled out for genetic data? Like, could I share my stuff today with, on the blockchain? We don't have this rolled out. We're just working with this system. So for the Cancer Gene Trust, we have one version that uses blockchain and one version that doesn't use a blockchain that's even simpler, um, but just as a start. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that we get people start start to sharing, starting to share right away with a little overhead and just get it going and then add more bells and whistles as we go on. Um, the blockchain would be important for transparency. Uh, it, it, we're using it as a public ledger, which you know you can you can record all of the transactions uh, that have taken place. The simplest transaction is, you know, Sue decided to share this genetic information, and Billy used that genetic information, and and Bob shared this information, and so forth. All of these things being transparent and being available. Uh, in a public record 
that can't be forged or cheated or something like that is very, very important. Um, and in sense, when you say share the data, this is the other part of this. Um, most people are thinking share the data with who right. and who has control of the data. What does share the data? We give it all to Google and they distribute <laughs> it or we give it all to the U.S. government and they build a big database that the world can use and so forth. Most people are unhappy with those solutions. Uh, they really want something that's organic, like the internet itself, so that we are essentially posting that data onto a shared database that is essentially a globally shared database. And in that, the blockchain may be one mechanism for keeping track of who does what uh, in terms of submitting data and using the data. And if it's transactional, then you can actually use that to create an economy of the type you were talking about, right? So you can keep track of who's using your data. You can get various uh, uh, types of feedback or even value back uh, from the data. I'm highly discouraging of the idea of selling your genomic data. At this point, I think that will hold research back. Agreed. I would like to pe people to first consider contributing data to science uh, for the purposes of knowing that you did something good for the world. I, I fully agree. I support that. We run a pediatric cancer uh, program, and I'll tell you briefly about it. So. We, uh, the governor of California announced a precision medicine initiative in California. There was a serious competition for that uh, about a year ago. And uh, of all the applications, we were thrilled that ours was one of two that were picked. And the uh, program is called the California Kids Cancer Comparison. It is the idea of introducing DNA comparison into the treatment of kids with cancer. So a kid comes into one of the hospitals that treats kids with cancer, and there are only about a dozen in, 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 in uh, California, less than a dozen in California. Um, uh, they would be referred from a smaller clinic up into one of these larger hospitals. Um, and it, either the case is the kind that there is a standard therapy that's very likely to work, in which case the kid gets this therapy, or the child has a type of cancer that we really don't know how to treat, or the child, the worst case, is the child is coming back with a recurrent cancer that was treated before and now has emerged resistance or is resurging again. Those are particularly hard to treat. So the proposal to the governor and the state of California is every kid in either the latter two ca categories, if their cancer is hard to treat from the get-go or they're coming back with a second cancer, they should have their genome sequenced. We should look at all the mutations in the tumor and try to come up with a precision medicine treatment for this child. And this was accepted. We are well into it. We, we have three clinical trials, which is a, a mechanism for trying to do creative, more creative things with uh, treatment. The one is a cancer with, uh, one is in uh, the pediatric cancer group at Stanford with uh, Alejandro Sweet Cordero, fabulous uh, pediatrician who works in the area of pediatric cancer. And he's uh, now um, invited us to participate in the weekly tumor boards that they have where we discuss the individual hard to treat cases and we present all of our genetic analysis along with the regular cancer analysis and all of the best minds at Stanford think about, well, okay, what can we do for this kid who's failed the original therapy and now we're looking for an alternative? And this is just an enormous opportunity to have an impact at this stage. What we're mainly suffering from in this and a similar program at UCSF and a similar program at UC Irvine Children's Hospital of Orange County. Um, we're all involved in these things and we're finding that the biggest frustration is that these kids have different combinations of mutations and there isn't a database out there that we can look up to find similar kids. This is just, I'll get back to this, this is why the Global Alliance is so important. Do you know there are other kids that have had mutations like this? God damn it, why can't we find them and understand what happened to them and allow it to treat the next kid? So 
If we talk to parents, do they want to share this information? Yes, they want to share this information, and purely for the satisfaction of knowing that their child's struggle helped some other child. Absolutely. That's enough. They don't want to get paid. Not at all. And they don't care whether a pharmaceutical company is going to make a drug out of it. They would like to just help other kids, and they want to share this information. So we are trying to help them share this information so every kid has a fighting chance. Every kid can learn from every other kid who's ever had cancer. So obviously I get a little agitated about this, but that's really important. That's, that's what this, this is about, is helping people. A friend of mine, Alexander Carmichael, uh, started a company called Patients Like Me. And yes, I think it's great. Okay, yes. and, and I, I, I love Alexander. She, she's unique, and she, yes. has this, she has the autoimmunity, right? In fact, I would, I would argue she probably had mold exposure, <laughs> given all her symptoms, but she and I have talked about all kinds of stuff, uh, and I have no idea if, if mold is it or not, but and she's been very open about this, so I wouldn't talk about it. But uh, So anyway, she said, okay, there's tens of thousands of people who deal with all this stuff every day. Why don't we get together and run our own trials because things are too slow? They did exactly the same thing, but they didn't have the genetic data because this was five years ago. Exactly. So right. what we're talking about now is patients like me 2.0 with genetic data, and you're putting the structures in place in a nonprofit to facilitate um, actually control for parents who have sick kids. You know, Find the other three sick kids like this find the gene therapy that worked for one of them and maybe it'll help me. Like that, that is a, that we owe that to each other as human beings. I, I bet I support that all the, all the way. I love that line. Can we use that line? It, it's yours to do it. But, yeah. We owe this to each other as human yeah. beings. That's exactly why we need to share yep. these data. Uh, and, and that's the motivating factor for why I share all the biohacks I do too. Like, like no one gave me an instruction manual and I weighed 300 pounds and I had a, you know, arthritis and all these other things. And I, I'm irritated that I spent 20 years and uh, almost a million dollars hacking it. But hey, <laughs> I'm happy I'm here. <laughs> so, right. well, I, this has been a fascinating interview. And, and I've got one more question for you, David. Okay. If someone came to you tomorrow and they said, based on everything you've learned in, in your life, not just in your academics, but, but in everything, uh, I want three pieces of advice. I, I want to perform better at everything. Like, like I, I want to kick ass at everything I do. What are the three most important things I need to know? <laughs> oh, um, you know, this is, <laughs> this goes back to the classic, uh, uh, the, you know, the classic kind of response to the, uh, to the actually to the genome skeptics, right? So you get your, the classic story is you get your genome sequenced and you get total, totally quantified self and you know everything about it and, and you ask the biggest guru in the world and uh, he says, um, yeah, there's three things you need to do. Exercise, <laughs> eat right, and get plenty of sleep. <laughs> Thank you, I paid $30,000 for that. <laughs> <laughs> Those come up remarkably often as answers right. to that question. <laughs> so yeah, the the problem there, and and this this parable is actually you know has some some essence to it that's important to understand is that you know the human body and our physiology and our health is a very very complex process and uh, we are only gradually starting to understand it. And part of it is because we were working with it as a black box for so long uh, that those, you know, those, the previous medicine just simply was in this hopeless state of not being able to open the box and see what's going on. And we're only now starting to make that transition to where we can start to understand the complexity of what's going on. But in there, it's still incredibly daunting. And, and there's still lots of things we can't measure. And there are lots of modalities that we can't model. And so until we get a lot more data and a lot smarter, it's still going to be difficult to give a very precise plan for uh, maximum health. Um, and, but the only way, all I can say is the only way we'll get there is massive sharing of data, massive data of an analysis, and engagement of everybody. I welcome citizen scientists for getting involved. And, they would have been shut out completely up until now. There was no way they could get access to any data they needed. So we need to bring the best minds to bear on this. Well, so some of those best minds are probably biohackers who are dealing with these conditions and are unwilling to keep dealing with it. I'm, I'm one of them. Yeah, that's great. You have the strong motivation and brilliance, and so we need to make an avenue 
uh, through a, a global sharing and internet-based um, infrastructure where we can share these data, still protect the privacy of the individual's uh, information, um, but nevertheless share with individuals who can help. David, where can people find out more about the initiatives that you're working on uh, and how can they support them? Go to uh, Global Alliance and Health, uh, Global Alliance uh, for Genomics and Health.org. You can do ga4gh.org is the kind of the geek site, but if you just Google Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, just Google that phrase, you will get the main web pages. It's all about our projects and our leadership. We have an enormous uh, participation. More than 400 different institutes from 40 different countries are members and are participating. Our scientific advisory board is very illustrious. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH here, for example, is on our scientific advisory board, just to drop one name there. Uh, so we do have a substantial um, investment in data sharing at this point. And if you're a geek, um, you can go directly to the GitHub site where you can see all of our open source code. And anyone can participate. It's a classic open source culture. Yeah. If you start actually um, making creative uh, enhancements to the code, all you do is you can come out of anywhere. We, we don't require uh, membership or anything like that. But if your code is if your code change or pull request, as they say, um, is uh, gets thumbs up from three different uh, other uh, existing engineers on the project, then it will be incorporated into the code base and you've now become a developer for the Global Alliance. Um, that's, this is the Apache voting rules of open source, right? Three plus ones and no minus ones. And your pull request is accepted. So it's a very, it's an open, um, embracing, um, welcoming community of geeks that are trying to make a difference. And we want everybody to join. David, thank you so much for being on Bulletproof Radio today. It's been uh, very illuminating. I appreciate you taking a really complex topic and making it something uh, that all of us can understand. Thank you. All right. All the best. And with your health quest, we'll uh, celebrate when you're 180 and I'm 200. It, it's a deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for watching. Don't miss out. To keep getting great videos like this to help you kick more ass at life, subscribe to the Bulletproof YouTube channel at bulletproofexec.com/slash YouTube. Thanks for watching and stay bulletproof.